Hello, in this video I'm going to go over quiz 19, which had those two AP style problems. So problem number one, rain is falling into a bucket. At t equals zero, the bucket holds three liters of water. So we'll probably need this at some point, but it's easy to forget. At time t, water is falling into the bucket at a rate given by this function. So how much water in liters falls into the bucket between t equals zero and t equals four? So we're basically trying to go from the rate at which it falls into the bucket to how much has fallen. What is the change in the amount of water due to falling in? So that's what a definite integral does for us. <clears throat> and if you put that in your calculator, you get 8.549. And I essentially scored this as one point for presenting the correct integral and one point for getting the right answer up to three decimal places. Okay, for b, find b prime of 2. Well, if you taught this to your calculator, you can do that pretty much directly. b prime of 2 automatically from the calculator is 0.5526. <clears throat> you can round up or down in that case. So what does this mean? Well, the, t is refer the 2 is referring to time, and it's a rate of change. So something is changing at a rate of this number. Okay, well, what's changing? B, right? B prime is the rate at which B is changing, and B measures the rate at which water falls into the bucket. So B is changing. B is changing at a rate of 0 0.5526. And the units here would be units for B, which is liters per hour, per units for time, liters per hour per hour. <clears throat> so this one, I scored one point for getting this number correct. Just show you know how to do it on your calculator. No need to take the derivative by hand. And then one point for a correct interpretation. Right? You really needed to talk about the rate changing. We have a rate of a rate. If you only said rate, if you said the rate is, uh, you are not getting full credit. Okay, part C. The bucket has a capacity of 10 liters and will start to overflow when this volume is reached. The bucket also has a small hole and water leaks out at a rate of 0 0.5 liters per hour. Write, but do not solve an equation to find S, the time at which the bucket starts to overflow. So I want to think of this as starting volume plus water in plus water out equals 10. We started with three liters of water. From time zero to time s, the amount of water that goes in would look like this. It's the definite integral from zero to s of b of t. Oh, this should be minus minus the amount of water out, well, it goes out at a rate of 1.5. And this is s, not 5. If you just said that this is 1.5 times s, that's fine. right? You're showing that you know how the rates work. This is equal to 10. <clears throat> uh, I scored this as two points if it was perfect, and then you lose a point if you have one forgivable minor error. But if you have two significant errors, it's a zero. Okay, during the time interval from zero to seven, at which time is the volume of water in the bucket at a minimum? Justify your answer. So let's talk about this volume, right? So let's say let V of T measure the volume at time T. And one thing we know right away, well, actually we could put a, a we could write a formula here, V of T, right? Giving this a name makes it so much easier to talk about. V of t, if we mimic what we did before, looks like this. Now, if we're being really careful, we have to change the variable name so that t is what we're plugging in. They are somewhat, they are actually quite forgiving of this on the AP as because you're going to later plug in numbers and everything will work out. And V prime would be b of t minus 
This is the overall rate of change, rate in minus rate out. You don't need to give the volume function a name if you can talk clearly about the rate at which the volume changes. So we know that the volume will be at a minimum at either one of these endpoints or a critical point. Let's find the critical point. <clears throat> so our critical point, we would set this equal to zero. Make that 100% clear. Don't just say you're finding critical points. Demonstrate what that means. But then I can do this on my calculator, and I get t equals 8 point, 0 0.837. Now, if you played around on your graph just to get some intuition for this, you would find that the B, the rate at which it goes in, starts out less than 1.5, but then eventually gets bigger. And it stays bigger for a while. So what's going on here is we know originally the rate at which it's draining is faster than the rate at which it enters the bucket but then later it comes into the bucket faster. So you can actually use that as long as you're really clear. So what we can say is uh, from T going from zero to 8.37, V prime of T is negative. The water is draining faster than it comes in. And you can just state that clearly. You do have a formula there. They, you know, they know you can compare that to zero or compare these numbers on your calculator, just as long as you're giving a clear name and a clear statement. And then from 0 0.837 until we get to 7, V prime is positive. So what you are allowed to do here is say, OK, on this interval, I only have one critical point. And it's definitely a local minimum. V prime is negative, and then V prime is positive. My volume goes down, and then my volume goes up, and there are no other changes. So what that means is that local minimum will also be the overall absolute minimum. So we can say, thus, the volume will be at a minimum at t equals 0 0.837. You also could have done uh, the candidates test where you say it occurs at an endpoint or a critical point and you test each one of those very clearly. Um, that would work like too. The way I scored this one was basically one point for thinking about this that understanding we want to know when is the rate in equal to the rate out, which is equivalent to saying when is the overall rate of change for the volume equal to zero. One point for identifying this number that works out to be the answer. And then one point for being pretty clear about why it's the answer, either giving this kind of analysis or doing your table. Um, just one thing I want to point out, if you do a table label it, I saw some examples of people just writing numbers Everything you do should have a label. If it is a sign chart, put a label on it. If it is a table, put a label on it. If you just have numbers floating around, don't expect credit. And I've been grading things and grading your practice AP exams. I saw examples of people getting answers wrong, not labeling their work, and I couldn't give partial credit because I literally did not know what people were trying to do. When you just write a formula without clearly labeling it as f of x or f prime of x or something like that, and it's wrong, I don't know how wrong it is because I don't know what you were trying to do. Everything you write should have a label. All right, let's move on to number two. So f is a differentiable function from 0 to 7, and here is the graph of the derivative two line segments in a semicircle, and we're given this piece of information. Presumably, we will need it. Um, a version of this problem that also comes up is where they say something like, oh, you know, here's a graph of G and F of X is defined to be the definite integral from like 1 to X of G of T dt. And then you actually have to go through the work of making that observation. 
But in this case, it's just given to us that the thing we see the graph of is the derivative of f. Okay, so find f of 4. So we want to use f prime to get information about f. Let's use a definite integral. So the definite integral from 1 to 4, 1 because we're given this information, 4 because we want it at 4, of f prime of x is f of 4 minus f of 1. You can present this in other ways, but just present something that is 100% clear and 100% correct. Then do other steps and fill things in. Right. This is a point. On the AP, this would be a point. If you just start doing stuff without a clear presentation of how you're going about this problem, you might get a zero. Okay, now this definite integral we can interpret as an area. It is this triangle plus this semicircle. This triangle here, one-half base times height, has an area of one. This semicircle, half of a circle, so one-half pi r squared, the radius is one. It's two units across, but the radius is one. So this area is pi over two. So we have one plus pi over two equals f of 4 minus f of 1, which is negative 3. And if we subtract 3 from each side, we have f of 4 is pi over 2 minus 2. Uh, FYI, I scored this as 1 point for an unambiguous presentation of something like this that you are just making it clear you're going to do the fundamental theorem of calculus and here's how all the pieces work together and then one point if you get to the correct answer. A lot of people made mistakes in terms of area of the triangle, area of the semicircle. Lock down this point by writing this perfectly clearly then filling stuff in. Okay, same graph so you don't have to page go to other pages so we want to find any value where f has a local maximum here is the thing you want to keep in mind we are given f prime in graph form for all of these problems no matter how obvious it thinks you think it is that you're what you're doing if we are given f prime we want to talk about f prime Whatever you have been given, talk about that thing. So f has a local maximum. The way I do these is I actually write my explanation before I even know what the answer is. f has a local maximum when, let me talk about f prime. f has a local maximum when f prime switches from positive to negative. That is the relevant fact. I am going to talk about how to find a local maximum for f by likening it to information about f prime. This is my explanation before I've even thought about the answer. Now, where does this occur? This occurs at, where does f prime, this thing that I see, switch from positive to negative? At x equals 4. I scored this as one point for the correct answer and one point for a solid explanation. Part C is similar. F is concave up when, so we want to liken this to F prime, right? You might want to say that F double prime is positive, but we don't see F double prime. If you want to say that in addition to things, that's fine. But f is concave up when f prime is increasing. We're going to talk about the thing we see. And this occurs on the interval from 2 to 3. If you made that an open interval, no one cares. Technically, you can include the endpoints. Again, one point for the answer and one point for a solid explanation. <clears throat> okay, last one. So here we have graph of f prime. We want to find g, g of x is x times f of x. We want to find g double prime of 1. The only way you can do this 
is if you find g double prime of x first. I saw some examples of people just plugging in 1 and doing something, right? g double prime of 1 means what is the value of the function g double prime of x when x is 1. So let's carefully find that derivative using correct notation. g prime of x, okay, product of derivative of the first times the second plus first times derivative of the second. So that's f of x plus x times f prime of x. g double prime of x is f prime of x. And now I need product rule again. So derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. So when I simplify this, I have 2 times f prime of x plus x times f double prime of x. So now g double prime of 1 would be 2 times f prime of 1 plus 1 times f double prime of 1. And now these I can find from the graph. I have the graph of f prime. So right here, I can see just from that point on the graph, f prime of 1 is 2. f double prime is the derivative of f prime. f prime is linear. The slope of f prime right now, and I can say slope because it's linear. Generally speaking, lines only, only lines have slope. Try not to say slope when you can say a word like derivative. But here, because it literally is linear, I can say slope, and I can measure that slope like a good Algebra 1 student, and I get negative 2. I saw some people getting 2. You should be able to look at this thing and just know the slope is negative. So when we plug that in, we have 2 times 2 plus 1 times negative 2, and that works out to 2. Uh, what am I writing for? Yikes. That works out to 2. Um, which, you know, maybe is an answer you obtain by doing incorrect things. Don't expect full credit for that. Um, the way I scored this was 1.4 correctly getting the second derivative. 1 point for demonstrating at least one of these facts, assuming you did something reasonable. So if you made some kind of accidental goofy mistake in doing product rule or something, but still made it clear that you had either f prime or f double prime and were demonstrating at least one of those, you got one point there. And then one point finally for getting the final correct answer. Okay, there we go.